thank you so much to the organizing committee and um, to all for the invitation to speak here at MCPOP on point of care ultrasound in the NICU. I'm very excited to be here with you today. I have no financial disclosures. And our objectives today are to recognize the benefits of point of care ultrasound or POCUS in the NICU, and also to describe various applications for clinician performed bedside ultrasound in the NICU. So a couple of scenarios, our current practice in the NICU. We have a one day old critically ill infant with moderate HIE, hypotension on cooling protocol with a morphine drip. The nurse is telling you there's no urine output for my shift. So do you give a bolus? Do you place a Foley? Do you do something else? We have a newborn infant that's undergoing a UVC placement. They've come back from the BR. We've got the line placed. You're now waiting for x-ray. Line is in the liver. You manipulate it further. You're waiting again for x-ray. And now your line's in, but it needs adjusting. So you need another x-ray for final confirmation. Two hours later, woohoo, the line is finally in. But maybe there is a better way. It's a two day old with respiratory failure with haziness on this chest x-ray and obliteration of some of the cardiac silhouette. Can you tell from this x-ray whether it's consolidation? Is it fluid? Do you see that plural line well? Now ultrasound can help us differentiate. An x-ray can look similar, but uh, for both ultrasound findings, but on the left, you can see some consolidation. Here's the liver up here. You've got lung down at the bottom here. And certainly this looks different from what you see with a liver here on this exam, uh, this image on the, on the right and the fluid and pleural effusion that you can see on the left. So you've got on the left side here, consolidation of your pleural uh, of the lung. And on the right, you have a pleural effusion. Now, point of care is increasingly being adapted for bedside evaluation. This article from 2018 in JAMA Pediatrics suggests that adding insonation or bedside ultrasound would enhance the physical examination. Many medical schools are now teaching their students ultrasound and many specialties such as emergency medicine, anesthesia, OB, utilize ultrasound as part of routine assessment. And so we're getting somewhat behind in the NICU. And it's interesting because more and more medical students and residents are coming in with point of care ultrasound experience from training and they are ahead of us in some of their imaging capabilities. So what is point of care ultrasound? Well, it is a myth, me, uh, methodology to be able to provide an immediate answer to a clinical question. Is my UVC too low? Is it in the liver? Is there urine in the bladder? Should I place a Foley? It allows for serious assessments, modern change over time, such as in the lung parenchyma. And POCUS can be formed for procedural purposes. So putting in a line, arterial line under ultrasound guidance or for diagnostic, looking at fluid, such as the pleural, pericardial effusion. So the benefits of bedside ultrasound, you're asking a specific question. It is time sensitive. You can pull the ultrasound machine over and you've got an infant who's crashing. Can you look and see, is there a pericardial effusion? It's a very limited evaluation. So again, speaking to the rapidity of it. It helps you to refine your differential and it also can help you to guide treatment. Now, point of care ultrasound has been around for a while. Now it's evolved over the past few decades, initially reported as a tool for evaluation of, after abdominal trauma in the 1970s. Use for trauma continues to expand around the world and was increasingly adopted by in the emergency room and among surgeons in the 1990s. The term FAST exam, which many of us are familiar with is hearing about it, the focused assessment with sonography for trauma was coined in 1996 and continues to be referenced today for rapid bedside abdominal evaluation. The American College of Emergency Physicians statement uh, uh, published a statement supporting POCUS in 1990. And by 1996, the core ED fellowship training included point of care ultrasound. There were guidelines developed by the American College of Emergency Medicine in 2001 with continued iterations on scope of practice. And point of care ultrasound is fairly standard in emergency medicine um, with an opportunity actually for an additional year of ultrasound um, uh, fellowship training. And in 2016, the Society of Critical Care Medicine in adults published guidelines for use of bedside ultrasound in intensive care units. Among anesthesiologists, transesophageal echocardiography 
were, was first introduced intra-op in the 1980s and guidelines were published for anesthesia in the 1990s. So there are many specialties that are using point of care and bedside ultrasound um, in practice already. Now for pediatrics, we have been a little bit behind in pediatrics and the point of care ultrasound, but it's increasingly being utilized. And um, from a, a PICU portion, uh, PICU standpoint, they've been practicing and doing point of care ultrasound for a bit of time, particularly for um, procedural based. So while some pediatrics um, specialties have been performing, NICU is behind other critical care, care fields. Two surveys highlight the interest and focus by neonatology, but barriers to implementation included factors such as lack of training opportunities, lack of collaboration, lack of awareness on what you can do with point of care. So on this study um, compilation by Nguyen in 2016 and Mirza in 2017 of surveys, um, PICU had 97% of them had access to ultrasound machines, only 67% of NICU. Um, and ultrasound was used for diagnosis and management in 76% of PICUs compared to 29 of NICUs. And this may be a bit skewed population of who answered the surveys. Um, for procedural guidance, most of the PICUs are using procedural guidance, particularly for line placement um, and for chest tube placement. For NICU, certainly not as much. So what can we use POCUS for in the NICU? Well, there's actually quite a bit. So we can look at it for procedural, and we'll go over these, and diagnostic capabilities. So as more specific, for procedural, we can look at arterial lines and placement, central lines, and including umbilical lines and pick lines, LP, suprapubic aspiration, um, draining of cavities. And then from diagnostic, we can look at UVC, where the UVC is, um, and where pick lines um, are. Um, look on cardiac exam. We can look at the lung and try to differentiate different pathologies. An ET2 placement, bladder for volume assessment. Look at the head for rapid evaluation for, inter, for IVH, intravitreal hemorrhage, and ventricular megaly. And looking at some of these are up and coming, and there are certainly more, um, more imaging capabilities that are coming up. So first, let's talk about procedural use, including the placement of arterial lines and central lines. So this study back from 2013 looked at ultrasound-guided radial artery catheterization in infants and small children, and found that first attempt success and overall successful procedure was enhanced by using ultrasound and to identify the artery by technique applications overall, such as hematoma formation were less. This is an image from one of our fellows, Iman Hidari, who um, was doing an ultrasound guided arterial line placement. So you can see the artery here and the needle as it enters into the artery itself. So you get visualization of it with, um, as you follow the needle through the skin into the artery itself. Now a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials of arterial line placement demonstrated an overall benefit of ultrasound guidance versus traditional. And this is even in the pediatric population. It was associated with increased first attempt success, decreased mean attempt to success, mean time to success, and again, incidence of hematoma formation. We reviewed a um, cohort of our patients that had ultrasound guided arterial lines versus non-ultrasound guided lines. Um, this is currently unpublished data, but we were looking to see if the attempts were improved and were less in ultrasound guided. We did find that the number of attempts in ultrasound guided lines were less in those that were with ultrasound guided versus non ultrasound guided. And perhaps, and this is in the population of patients greater than 2.5 kilos. And perhaps what was even more interesting was to see that the lines placed um, by ultrasound guided technique were all done by providers less, with less than five years of experience in neonatology as opposed to those with non-ultrasound guided, only 50% of them had less than five years of experience. Many of these were more experienced um, uh, neonatologists or clinicians. So it's interesting to see that less experience were able to have better success overall with ultrasound guided procedures. And this makes sense when also thinking about that some trainees in, are coming in with ultrasound experience. So the learning curve is not gonna be as high. This study by uh, Dr. Katharia and colleagues was the first randomized evaluation of ultrasound guided peripherally inserted central catheters. They found that use of ultrasound 
for pick line placement, decreased the time of line placement by 30 minutes. The ultrasound was able to identify the pick line faster and had an additional overall savings of 38 minutes if only the ultrasound is used for confirmation and not necessarily relying on radiology as well. Umbilical vein, place, vein catheter placement by POCUS. This was an early study by uh, Jay Kim from 2011 that evaluated ultrasound, umbilical vein placement via point of care ultrasound and found that mean time to final placement was much less, 75 versus 139 minutes. Um, X-rays taken were less in the ultrasound group. And manipulators were also overall less. The use of ultrasound time decreased placement by 40, 64 minutes and decreased the number of manipulations and X-rays obtained. Now, when looking at the umbilical line tip position, and we started to do this more regularly in our, in our NICU, um, is to look at the tip of the UVC in relationship to the IVC RA junction. And so this is a, a set of images looking at variations compared with what their X-ray looked like. So on this x-ray, the line looked low. And in fact, the line was just about the tip of the ductus venosus. Here's the entrance of the ductus venosus with the entrance into the IVC, extending out. Shasia, yes. I, I'm going to interrupt. I'm sorry, it's Christina. I'm going to ask yes. you to turn off your video. You're breaking up occasionally. Oh, OK. So, um, let's have you turn off your video and see if that improves. Sure. OK. Let me know if that, is, if that works. Thank you. Um, so this, these images demonstrate the UVC in varying positions compared with X-ray. So I said this first image, the, um, the UVC is just at the uh, uh, ductus venosus IVC junction. Here in the middle, this is the right atrium in here, the liver here with a line coming into the right atrium just past the IVC RA junction. And this correlates approximately by X-ray. And on the right, we have an example of a high UVC in the right atrium. And that the tip appears to be further up towards the atrial septum in here with the right atrium sitting in this area here and the line coming in through the ductus venosus. And you can see the line tip fairly deep in the heart. In addition, POCUS can be utilized for real-time manipulation of the UVC. So this x-ray demonstrated the line was fairly deep in the heart. And so by Looking, I apologize for the trappiness of the clip here, but you can see that here's the tip of the UV. And this is early on before we had um, acquisition capabilities that downloaded the system we currently have. But the IVCR junction is sitting around in here. And so we are currently manipulating the, the UV under ultrasound guidance and looking for where the line is once we move it back. So as there are some image that you can see of the line that enters, here's the SVC here, this is the right atrium, and the line is as we'll see in just a minute, is, has now been pulled back and is in a little bit better position. It's a eustachian valve in here. So just above the IVCRA junction. So a better position that we were able to um, perform under ultrasound guidance. Now to illustrate um, what this looks like, um, this is an, an image of the umbilical vein as it comes in to the umbilical recess. Once the line is in umbilical recess, then you can try to manipulate it into the ductus venosus, and this is what we're trying to get it into to try to get towards the heart. But as you can see, it can be fairly easy to get to the liver. And so there has been some success among neonatologists with manipulating the UVC under ultrasound guidance after initial failure in the liver. Um, the radio radiograph on the left um, illustrates that course. And on the right, you can see this is the umbilical recess. The UVC is right in here and you can see the line moving through the ductus venosus and entering into the IVC and the IVC RA junction. Um, so you are, be able to, you are able to pull out the ductus venosus when you look at this by ultrasound. Um, Dr. Alan Groves described this technique nicely on his website, nikupocus.com, if you want to take a look at that. It basically involves pulling the line back to about two to four CMs, depending on the size of the neonate, um, and then opening the ductus venosus via ultrasound um, using a small amount of flush, and we've had some luck with manipulating these lines in the correct position that originally failed in the liver. It's not 100%, but we've been able to do some. Um, so next, we'll move to lumbar puncture. So LP um, use 
uh, ultrasound assisted lumbar punctures are associated with a higher success rate, fewer traumatic LPs, and a shorter time to successful um, LP, fewer needle passes, and lower patient scores. Remember that up to some have reported up to 50% failure rate for traditional LP, I mean, the pediatric patients. And as we overall individuals do less and less ultrasound or less and less um, procedures as an LP, having some mechanism to be able to visualize and um, um, help with identifying structures and fluid pockets may be useful um, with this lumbar puncture. So ultrasound can also be helpful in identifying pathology or debris such as hematoma, prefer uh, potentially deferring cases rather than trialing again and again and being unsuccessful. So this study outlines pathology found when neonates were referred for diagnostic or interventional radiography after a failed LP attempt. 23 infants had intrathecal or epidural echogenic hematoma that was seen on ultrasound after a failed attempt. Five had minimal fluid and four had normal fluid. Um, the LP was deferred or canceled in 14 cases based on ultrasound finding. And what was particularly interesting because as we are doing more ultrasound in the unit, we're seeing that there are some, uh, there is some evidence of hematoma and should we try it anyways? But in this study where they looked at this, um, nine in the, of the 23 patients with no visible CSF or hematoma formation, the LP was deferred in 14, but nine of them underwent image guided LP. There was no sample in one of those. Eight of them, only blood was returned. Two of those were sent off. Um, and had enough for culture, but the other six were not sent. Of the five that had minimal CSF, four underwent image guided LP um, and one was deferred. Of those four, two returned enough for CSF and two were bloody, one of which was adequate for culture. Um, the four normals all were able to obtain the fluid from those. So seeing a hematoma or seeing minimal fluid may be an indication that if, we've, um, if that was subsequent to a failure, that we may wanna delay the LP even further. So you can perform static or dynamic ultrasound in our unit. Um, uh, this is one of our fellows here um, who is doing the ultrasound um, with our nurse heard it holding. Um, and we can identify and mark the location for needle insertion um, and looking at the, the, um, the conus, identifying the, the end of the conus um, and then narrowing of the spinal canal, and you can mark those with a surgical marker. And this can be useful because yes, then it often correlates with the landmark um, technique, um, but you can feel a bit more comfortable or reassured going up um, a space that you're out of the area of the conus. Um, and so here's a couple examples um, of um, transverse view of the uh, spinal canal um, with fluid that's well seen. Um, and then on the um, lateral view here, you can see the conus and the tip of the conus with the epidural space, nice fluid amounts, um, and the phylum terminalis um, with the cauda equina in there. So this looks like a good amount of fluid. Now, what's not great about babies is that you can see um, that the bones have not ossified as yet. Um, so the imaging is beautiful compared to the pediatric population where you just don't have this kind of clarity. This is an example of abnormal echogenic material, so like the hematoma formation after initial LP failure. Um, and again, the um, conus is here. And then here's another nice example of some good fluid. Now CHOP is currently undergoing a prospective study looking at neonates and infants less than six months to determine if bedside ultrasound assisted LP increases the proportion of first attempt non-traumatic LPs compared to traditional landmark palpation technique. Um, they're looking for 190 participants and should be completed soon. So we'll see that information to know, does LP ultrasound in the neonates less than six months um, improve our ability to avoid traumatic taps and failures um, compared to traditional technique? Um, for, for another use that we can have is suprapubic aspiration. So suprapubic aspiration, it can be utilized to obtain a sterile urine sample. It minimizes the risk of contamination by bypassing a typically colonized distal urethra. It's fairly low risk. Um, uh, there are uh, some risks that you can have. You can have gross hematuria, suprapubic aspiration, abdominal wall cellulitis, and bowel perforation. Um, so having ultrasound can be useful. And ultrasound has improved the success rates for suprapubic aspiration compared to a blind approach. Um, the procedure took overall about the same time in about a minute, 
um, but there was an overall an increased overall success, success as first attempt, um, more urine um, volume that was obtained and less number of passes uh, for those who did ultrasound guided compared to blind approach. Now the most common reason for failure of suprapubic aspiration is lack of urine in the bladder. And the nice thing about ultrasound is you can look at that prior to the tap. So you don't have to guess, it. is there urine in the bladder when you're doing the suprapubic aspiration? You could take a look and see if, if there is. Um, and it's pretty quick. You do want to have everything ready um, so that you can do the ultrasound pretty quickly, or do the tap pretty quickly so the baby doesn't pee before you get the tap in. Um, but it certainly can be a nice way to look. So this is an example of, um, um, of a ultrasound guided suprapubic tap. And you can see the needle here. The bladder looks pretty full. And some of the reports mentioned that um, a, a, a width and height in the transverse view of about two CMs will be an adequate amount of fluid to be able to tap. Um, generally, you'll go about, um, as with just with suprapubic tap in general, go about 10 to 20 degrees um, angle um, perpendicular or from perpendicular to the bladder or to the abdomen and put the ultrasound probe above that um, and then try to get the midline when you're putting the needle in. Um, but you can see how easy it is to be able to see that ultrasound piercing through into the bladder and um, obtain the fluid. So let's talk through a case. We had a full term infant undergoing therapeutic cooling for HIE that I mentioned earlier. Um, he was on total fluids of 60 per kilo per day. BUN um, was 20, creatinine um, 0.8. This is you know, first 24 hours, so not terribly abnormal. Um, and then a morphine drip. Vital signs, heart rate. Um, a little lower with cooling, though not as low as we've sometimes seen. Um, respiratory rate of 38 and O2 of 92%. The nurse is reporting he's not had urine output in the last four hours. Um, is he dry? Um, does he have a full bladder and need a Foley? So a quick assessment can visualize um, the bladder, the bladder wall and a, a reasonable amount of fluid. You can see the markers on the side that give you an idea of depth. Um, and it takes a guesswork out of the picture. So a full bladder was imaged, a Foley was placed, and you can actually see the Foley on ultrasound as well. It's a transverse view, and here's a Foley catheter with less volume, um, overall smaller bladder volume that you can see. Next, we'll move to thoracentesis, paracentesis, a party, uh, pericardiocentesis, um, overall fluid in cavities. So there are different, many different pockets that fluid can be in. Um, so on the left, um, and, and Betts at ultrasound can answer this question pretty quickly. The important thing with ultrasound is, and we'll talk about this, is the training and really visualizing many, many normals that you'll more easily recognize when something doesn't look right. So this is an example of a little off-axis peristernal long-axis view looking at the heart here. You can see a pericardial effusion that sits behind the heart. And then beyond that, a pleural effusion as well in this patient. On the right, this is um, an abdominal imaging, looking at ascites. This liver is very abnormal um, looking. And you can see the, uh, some portions of bowel that are floating in fluid. In that literature, there's been, um, there's been a lot of literature looking at ultrasound guidance that, that it decreases complications and increases, improves the cost of care among patients undergoing thoracentesis and paracentesis. Ultrasound guided thoracentesis was associated with a 19% <clears throat> risk reduction of pneumothorax and a 68% reduction of bleeding from, a para from paracentesis. This adult emergency medicine study utilized bedside ultrasound in patients with hemodynamic collapse that entered into the ER and found that ED physicians were successful in identifying um, correctable etiology. So detecting hemodynamic collapse with correctable etiologies versus true um, PA with cardiac standstill. Um, and so they could identify and say, well, this patient had hemodynamic collapse, but we can see a pericardial effusion and, and intervene on that pericardial effusion um, and have increased survival or have survival. A POCUS or paracentesis can provide a rapid evaluation and guidance for the procedure. Potential complications of paracentesis include perforation of the intestines, bladder, liver, spleen, persistent fluid leak, infection, or hematoma at the insertion site. Um, in adult studies, use of ultrasound for paracentesis has demonstrated decrease 
in bleeding compl complications and overall cost of patient care. A NEA review article in 2019 outlined the procedure for an emergent neonatal abdominal paracentesis with a consideration to utilize ultrasound if readily available before and during the procedure to minimize outcomes. And as you can see, if you're doing an abdominal tap, the epigastric arteries do run along and you know, trying to avoid those and be able to see that by ultrasound can be useful as you're putting your needle in. So this is a, a, a patient who was delivered, an ex 34 week male, had a C-section for non-reassuring fetal heart tones. Prenatal history was significant for ascites. Positive pressure was started at birth and the abdomen was uh, notably pretty large and postnatal pocus confirmed the presence of massive ascites. Um, the the, the uh, tap was performed under ultrasound guidance and over 300 mLs of fluid was drained. Um, and you can see from this, oh, see here. So, this plays okay. so here's the huge pocket of fluid. And you can see this is you know, a slightly preemie child and this is depth is about three to four cms, which is pretty deep. Um, so this, uh, you'd be able to certainly see this baby's um, abdomen being distended. Here's the intestines floating around and then following the tap, a much different look. So much more compressed um, uh, and no, still some fluid you can see interspersed, but certainly not this big pocket um, that was pre present previously. So now we'll move to diagnostic uh, ultrasound and what we can look at by, by uh, and identify by ultrasound. Now, increasingly long ultrasound is being recognized for its utility in neonatal medicine to differentiate disease processes. Lung ultrasound uses air-generated artifact to describe lung aeration and determine pathologies. And many of the areas in, in ultrasound is really exciting, but lung ultrasound has, has really been increasingly used, utilized, and we're finding more and more ability to differentiate between different pathologies and potentially impact care. Um, so there is increasing literature on lung ultrasound use in the neonates. There was only a few, a few articles published in 2016, and a decade later, 2016, there's more, um, and certainly more in the uh, more recent years. Now, lung ultrasound can identify and differentiate pathologies such as transient tachypnea of the newborn and differentiate that from respiratory distress syndrome. It can identify um, patients with meconium aspiration syndrome, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, and pneumonia. And what's really great about lung ultrasound is it's fast. So once you're trained, once you can do lung ultrasounds, um, it's essentially looking at all the quadrants and you can do a full lung focus with evaluation and clips of the lung. And with that, you can obtain, you can see multiple different things. So this study is from um, a group with Raimondi and Daniel DeLuca who are leaders in the field um, in Europe in lung ultrasound and neonates. And um, they have demonstrated that initiation of lung ultrasound program or a, a point of care ultrasound program in the NICU, roughly half the number of chest X-rays in their unit. These images demonstrate a normal pattern um, on the top left with A lines. And A lines, these lines going through here are simply reverberation of the plural um, lines or reverberation artifacts. So this is fairly normal looking and you can see deviations from normal. So alveolar interstitial pattern, um, these B lines, which are comet tails um, with fluid that can um, uh, cause artifact that goes all the way down the image screen um, to coalescing B lines. So um, increased pathology, this can be consistent with respiratory distress syndrome or TTN. Um, with respiratory distress syndrome, you may have an abnormal pleural line with subpleural consolidations, a large con amount of consolidation that you can see with pneumonias or meconium aspiration, um, double lung point, which you can see as normal uh, portions of normal lung intermixed with portions that seem to have more fluid that you can see with TTN before it clears, um, an area called lung point, which you can see with normal thorax, and then microcystic lesions on lung ultrasound that you can see with CCAM or CPAM. So there are different things. And as there's a pretty steep learning curve for lung ultrasound. So once you learn which different artifacts and you see more and more normal, you'll again start to recognize when things look abnormal. And so this is an example on the left of an image of a fairly, fairly normal lung ultrasound. Here, 
pleural line is sitting here, the ultrasound probe is here, pleural line with reverberation A lines going through, a couple of maybe some B lines that come through indicating some pathology or can be normal um, in the first uh, couple of days or initially after birth. Compared to this patient, um, this clip from one of the nurse practitioners, uh, Christine Manapon, demonstrates a patient with um, respiratory distress syndrome near whiteout and some of the um, pleura and some irregularity to the pleural line. Um, and we try to um, comment on the image as you see it so you can uh, um, reveal we'll know what kind of what things you're thinking about. Now, lung ultrasound scores have been used to identify the severity of the lung parenchyma, ranging from zero with that normal lung pattern, the A lines, um, to X3 of extended consolidation. Um, as of right now, we're using six lung fields, so the upper, um, lower, and the lateral on the right and the left for a total of six um, areas, and each area is scored based on what we see by ultrasound. And again, this whole process takes less than three to five minutes. Now, lung ultrasound use in neonates is a couple of studies. With, uh, um, these are both from coming up both from the European group that look at patients that were on CPAP um, to see if they can predict the need for cefactant. And in this study, they found that in infants less than 34 weeks, a lung ultrasound score, when you total up all the fields of four, um, predicted uh, with a cutoff of four, predict the need for cefactant. Um, of note, they found the lung ultrasound score more useful and most useful in infants less than 34 weeks gestational age. When they took a later population, a later study looking at a population that was less than 30 weeks, then they were able to predict need for surfactant use um, at lung ultrasound scores, um, at least six to eight, with a need for surfactant redosing at a more severe lung score of greater than 10. Um, so this may be something that we want to start, we will consider rolling out and utilize as we learn more and more and get more experience in lung ultrasound to help identify patients that may benefit from earlier use of surfactant. And we can also use lung ultrasound in patients with meconium aspiration. This is an example of a 39, six, seven week infant, um, full term meconium staining intubated for respiratory distress. And you can see some consolidation um, in these areas. Here's what's supposed to be the pleural line with consolidation below the line here. Now this can consolidation, you can see also with pneumonia, but meconium aspiration will be both sides. And here's a corresponding x-ray with that. So using um, lung ultrasound, as we learn more, as we get more comfortable, um, it may be something that we'll be able to utilize and decrease x-rays or be able to identify patients and intervene on them um, sooner rather than later. Focus is also being utilized in some institutions um, to evaluate ET tube placement in the neonates. Now the ability to assess the ET tube tip is, um, we're able to do that because of the cart cartilage um, serum, it's pretty easy to see through into these babies. Um, and the agreement between ultrasound and x-ray is pretty good at 73 to 100%. And you can see the overlie here um, of the um, carina, the trachea in the carina, as it sits around the aortic arch and above the right pulmonary artery. So when you're looking by ultrasound, this is a mid-sagittal view that demonstrates the tip of the ET tube within the silhouette of the aortic arch and you can measure the distance from the tip of the ET tube to the right pulmonary artery as the carina should sit on top of the right pulmonary artery. So it can give you an indication potentially of where that ET tube tip is and if it's in a good location. It, it does take some practice to get this view and to look at it, um, but it is something that's reasonable to consider. A head ultrasound, so point of care ultrasound used for head ultrasound. Um, we can look at the presence of a bleed or ventricular megaly, mainly in acute situations. Um, in the NICU, we regularly obtain head ultrasounds in our patients, and we often review the images with radiology. You can get two views by an open fontanelle, um, particularly, in, especially in the first few months, six months of life. Um, and these images, my unit demonstrate um, a, a large bleed on the sagittal and coronal views that you can see pretty clearly um, with ventricular megaly, um, with fluid on the uh, top here, and then also on the um, coronal view below. Now, it, we would, it's not that it would necessarily take the place of ultrasound, and we can certainly get these images rapidly, but if you have an acute decompensation overnight, you can provide information quickly to confirm a suspicion um, as you're getting ultrasound there. 
Now we'll look at abdominal ultrasound. So bedside abdominal ultrasound is, is still very early in adaptation. Um, it's increasingly being explored as a means to differentiate varying pathologies and monitor process uh, progression. This paper out from 2019 out from Australia, who's really ahead of the game um, with training and utilization of point of care ultrasound in their NICU, um, asked the question, is the time right for neonatologists to perform point of care bowel ultrasound? So looking at peristalsis, bowel thickening, can you identify CPAP belly? Can you identify neck? And so there's been more interest in, in looking at this. And we really need more literature to be able to identify and discuss whether using bedside ultrasound, are we benefiting babies or are we potentially holding feeds more and calling neck on something that maybe wouldn't have been neck? So I think we still need to learn more about what we can use um, abdominal ultrasound for, point of, for, um, for neck, for example. So as we all know, neck is an acute abdominal pathology affecting up to 10% of preterm infants, um, characterized by necrosis of the mucosa inflammation. And you can see this both by x-ray and you address it clinically. Now, when you're looking at ultrasound and pathologic correlation, this is a nice um, um, ultrasound and path specimen comparison, looking at a somewhat thinner loop of bowel, especially in here, with some hyperechoic areas that may be consistent with gas. Um, um, and some hyperemic bowel wall thickening um, known as laterally. And so this ne necrotic type area, it correlate with this um, necrotic area of bowel um, uh, in the surgical specimen. So a compilation um, by this, this group looked at um, what are the progression for neck? So you have normal uh, vascularity and, and bowel wall um, size progress to increased vascularity and thickening, to decreased vascularity, to um, more decreased vascularity and further thinning, to asymmetric thinning um, that may be indicative of necrotic bowel. Now, patients can be any kind of variation time-wise along this spectrum. So again, we need more information to know how useful this is gonna be. Should we be doing more ultrasound in our preemies to be able to identify patients? Um, and I think more information is to come. And finally, we'll talk about cardiac. And I say cardiac a little bit for the end because there's been quite a discussion, um, ongoing discussion about cardiac point of care, cardiac ultrasound, differentiating from um, further training and evaluation for cardiac ultrasound. So there are many names for it, point of care cardiac ultrasound, cardiac point of care ultrasound, focused cardiac ultrasound, targeted neonatal echocardiography, neonatal performed echocardiography, and comprehensive with increasing training um, needed as you go further and further for, for um, image acquisition and interpretation. Our point of care ultrasound for cardiac is not a replacement for comprehensive echo. It's important to discuss at the bedside with the nursing team and the parents why um, POCUS is uh, being done and who is performing it. Again, the benefits, specific question, you have a patient compensating, is there pericardial effusion? Um, is the heart just not moving? Um, it's time sensitive, limited evaluation, you can refine your differential and guide treatment. Now the American Society of Echocardiography and the American College of Emergency Physicians came together in 2010 for a consensus statement for what can you look at by point of care um, focused cardiac ultrasound. And they deemed that presence of pericardial effusion, um, assessment of global systolic function, um, identifiers of ventricular enlargement, um, volume assessment, um, guidance of pericardiosynthesis, and then pacing wire placement. So it gave them somewhat of a guidance in the ER. The somewhat of an issue that we have in the NICU is we don't have proof of life that pediatric patients and adult patients may have. The risk of congenital heart disease in neonates is real. So if you have a patient that has a, a heart that is not moving well, it could be that you have a severe coarctation with um, uh, ventricular dysfunction, and you really need to identify those patients. So Potential indications would include line assessment, your pick lines, UVC lines, um, looking at cannula placement, um, cardiac effusion, and then with some more training, could you look at global systolic function, fluid responsiveness, though this can be difficult in patients who are intubated, and then right and left ventricular symmetry, patients that have significant pulmonary hypertension, they have a very big dilated right heart, so could you look at that as well? Here's an example on the left of a large pericardial effusion. Um, the heart here is sitting in a bag of fluid. And so comparing that, utilizing that with findings of cardiac tamponade, clinical findings of tamponade may lead you to want to tap this, this fluid collection. Here again, look at the UV um, 
you see coming in, it looks like it's going into the atrial, across the atrial septum into the LA. Um, so you may want to address that and be able to move, move that under ultrasound guidance. Again, looking at the effusion check with the image we saw previously, if you look right behind the heart, you can see a pericardial effusion, a little further back, a, a pleural effusion. It can be pretty quick to be able to put on once you see normals to be able to see what abnormal looks like. Um, looking at again, normal versus abnormal, so there's functional assessment in a normal heart. This is a peristal long axis tube. What you're looking at is this the left ventricle here? And the more you train, the more you know. This heart looks like it's working okay. This one does not. Um, this is a, an IVC sitting in here that you can see IVC collapse. Um, so maybe there is some degree of less uh, of hypovolemia. This looks, IVC looks more full. Here's the heart thing here. But if the patient is intubated, all bets are off on whether the patient is actually hypovolemic or not, or hypovolemic or hyper, or has enough fluid on board. And then finally, right and left asymmetry. This left ventricle looks nice and round and circular. RV is on top. And on below, you see a very big dilated left ventricle, a right ventricle on top. LV small. So all these things, you can look for more pathology um, over time. So in sum, there are many neonatal uses for POCUS, cranial imaging, cardiac, vascular access, bladder, lung. The sky's the limit on what we can do. Um, and one of the really um, uh, interesting things about think to think about is the European group created the SAFE protocol. So once you've been able to go through and say, I can, I can recognize and I can identify what normal abnormal is, then could you use an algorithm, and this algorithm is called a SAFE algorithm, that brings together ultrasound in varying locations to rapidly rule out the most urgent life-threatening emergencies in the NICU. So you first put the probe on, you have a kid that's crashing, you put the probe on, is the heart working? No, well, you should call cardiology and get an echo in here, stat for CH, is there congenital heart disease? Is there a tamponade? Um, or do you see fluid? Is that consistent with tamponade physiology clinically? Yes, then you can needle aspirate. No, then you can look at the lung um, and can you assess for pneumothorax? And so there are different ways that you can utilize lung ultrasound to potentially get to a certain pathology and be able to address it. Now, to briefly mention, I'm almost done with here, but to briefly mention, while it's great that there's increasing evidence of benefit for point of care ultrasound, there is recognition that they need quality assurance programs. Um, and in 2020, the Emergency Care Research Institute produced a report including point of care ultrasound as one of the top 10 tech hazards. And their concern was that the adaptation of it and adoption is outpacing safeguards. So we don't have safeguards, we're not having program oversight, we're not having protocols. And so what should we do about this? And the argument coming back from the um, pediatric critical care, um, art, this article from the Peds critical care um, uh, group looked at and said that, you know, they are, we are creating programs, but we are doing multidisciplinary collaborations that are addressing these questions, getting QI and QA processes. So we started a program um, that can initiated in 2018 um, for point of care in our unit. We had some um, older machines. We got some more newer machines. We've been training up with our attendings, um, fellows, nurse practitioners, um, hospitalists, and we uh, became joined with the PICU in 2020, which has been great, um, and being able to do QI and QA process together. We have muscle disciplinary involvement, including rheology and cardiology, and we have joint educational sessions with the PICU, including an annual fellow boot camp. For image acquisition, we at the bedside of every with every ultrasound or with every ultrasound machine, we have a QR code that um, Caroline No, one of our fellows, um, put together that will allow us to um, obtain these images and for the viewer to see what, um, what are the, for the person who obtained the image to be able to say what they um, saw and um, list their findings. We you see done, Dr. Shazia, yeah, I'm gonna have you work. start to close it up here. Okay, um, I only have two more slides, that works. So we are, um, have done over 500 ultrasounds. Initially we had a lot more um, UV lines because that's how we started it where we're increasing lung ultrasounds and many others. Um, and our POCUS team is, is pretty large at this point, and we're always wanting to have more and more learn ultrasound, um, but it does take a village. And that's it. Thank you so much. Can, can, you, come on, can you come on to the camera again and uh, stop sharing? Yep. We'd love to see you again. Thank you.
It's a great, that, that is a fabulous slide deck, great presentation. Um, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I ran a, a, an OB department, Department of OBGYN in my former life and uh, point that you cannot downplay the importance of point of care ultrasound. So let's kind of stick with your last theme there, the, the quality control aspect of all this. Um, can nurse, our nurses, uh, can they be deemed competent in something for like an IV or a Foley? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I think that is certainly something that is feasible. It's actually literature I don't know if it's been published yet, but I know one of the PICU um, has looked at putting PIVs under, sound, under ultrasound guidance and in teaching nurses and know how to identify. We have PIC, our, our PIC line team, um, um, which does involve nursing, has, has, is up and doing point of care ultrasound and doing ultrasound for putting in PIC lines and certainly for putting in PIVs. So I, I think involving the nurses is the next step we want to do and we want to do some more some education and being able to do bladder checks, being able to put in PIVs and thinking about other, what other things we can do is certainly somewhere we want to head. Perfect. Let's talk about cost for a minute. Um, you know, for many of us that have uh, either written grants or done capital, capital requests, when you're talking about the realm, right, because it's a wide range of what an ultrasound machine costs, I know that. What are you looking at for something that you would use perhaps every day in the unit? The ones that we have, I think one of the, you know, you use what you can get. So the first year or two, what we had was a machine that we didn't have a linear probe, so we weren't able to do as much um, procedural for line placement, but we had a reasonable um, phase array probe, which is good enough to look at a lot of the, uh, of the imaging. So, you know, whatever you can get initially, and then as you're developing your program, and we um, were fortunate to get a grant through the Lucille Packard Foundation that um, allowed us to purchase equipment. And what we were looking for, and what I was looking for particularly for equipment was to find probes we'd be able to use in the neonatal population um, and find ones that were very easy to, um, very user-friendly. So right, we've recently right. purchased one that's flat screened and is easily touch screen. And we adapt the machine for what we want um, and work with the reps to be able to do that. So that, I mean, having- Excuse me. No, no, go ahead. No, I was, but your last point is so key. And not only is that key for NICU and for these small populations, right, small size, but also an OB, that is key. You don't need bells and whistles sometimes. You yep. need a solid machine that is user-friendly and that can be, you know, called upon quickly. Agreed. You know, excellent. I mean, I can't tell you. And um, it was just a great presentation. So informational. I think the world of GI, you start to get it. At, it's going to, right? It's going to open up a yeah. whole new, oh my gosh, when you started bringing, I agree. it was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding? No, I agree. Dr. Cohen and I have had conversations about, about abdominal ultrasound and, uh, but they're, they're really the sky's the limit here. We're just touching yes. on what, I mean, with the neonates, they're, they're, they're uh, cartilaginous. They're not ossified yet. So the, the amount that you can see in a baby, it's our PICU colleagues are often jealous <sighs> of what we can see. I mean, those, lo those lo LP sites, if you just look at the spine on some of these kids, it's just beautiful what you can see. So there's a lot of applications. The lung ultrasound is exciting. Um, abdominal ultrasound up and coming. So there's a lot that we're going to be able to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Us. We really appreciate it. Everybody, make sure you're back by our a little bit before 1025. We try and start on time. I hope everybody's enjoying the day. Have a wonderful break. Thank you again, Dr. Dr. Thank you. Okay.